I do want to uh, sort of extend the conversation because just to be clear, I certainly want to advocate that traditions of radical blackness, black radical traditions, just an honest assessment and analysis of the situation would call for solidarity among Africans in America, the, through the diaspora, and certainly with those suffering in Palestine. Uh, but this seems to be continues to just come up in, I think, a very confused way. Uh, so I want to come back to that piece where I showed in that Spectre article, it was brought up that Frank Wilderson just dismisses any potential unity between Black people here in the U.S. and Palestinians, uh, and where it was said that he said that the idea itself was bullshit, quote, and the link in that article goes to the text of an interview that I and my uh, I Mix What I Like crew from WPFW 89.3 FM, the mighty WPFW in Washington, D.C., uh, where we were doing our show there and some years ago had interviewed Frank. I think this is 10 years ago now. And we were talking about his work in Afro-pessimism. We had interviewed him a number of times, starting with his work in Incognito, which for us, for me, has been, I think, part of the conflict, so to speak, with how I engage Frank's work and how others do. So I did start with Incognito, his memoir, where he talks about being a part of the, 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 uh, the, the armed underground in South African anti-apartheid struggles and working with Chris Hani and, and he, and uh, we took him at his word, take him, I take him at his word that the story is true. And, but I've also said to him publicly on this platform and say it again, at some point I admit, I don't care if the memoir <laughs> is not true because what he did in telling that story, I think was brilliant in its analysis and very inspirational. So I don't, so that's how, anyway, that was the bias with which I, I, I came to the whole question of, of Frank Wilderson's work and Afro-pessimism. I had not even read his Afro-pessimism arguments, didn't even know anything about it. We read, we read that book. So as, as I st kept continued reading and, and, I kept seeing this this issue come up and I've continued to see that this interview that we did some years ago continues to get brought we I'll put the link in the show description again I, I forgot to do it in advance when when Nora Ericott was on the program I don't know a year or so ago two years ago I don't know whenever how whenever it was this was one of the issues that she wanted us to clear up I thought we had I don't I don't know, but the issue itself has not seemed to be cleared up. So what I, I just want to, what I'll do is I want to show, so I, I showed the Spectre article, they said where Frank said, it's bullshit. So here's the text of, and I'll make sure all these links are available if, if they aren't already. And uh, this is the section where this part comes up. And part of the issue is, of course, that none of the other part of the, the, the rest of the interview was ever discussed. So the context is not really ever brought in. His approach to anti-blackness, his approach to Afro-pessimism, his approach to the, to, to the critique, his argument around it just being a, a, a a, a, you know, an idea, it's not even a, 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 a full, I forgot how he puts it, but it's, in other words, it's, it's just an, an approach that I think I keep oversimplifying as being an update of a race first analysis arguing that there's such a severe anti-blackness 
alienation, NATO, what is it, um, social death, and uh, um, can't even remember all the terminology. But my point is, all of this is ignored because at this point of the interview, uh, he says here, one of the things we need to deal with is the ways in which right reactionary white civil society has so-called progressive Wait a minute. One of the things we need to deal with is the ways in which right reactionary white civil society and so-called progressive colored civil society really works to sever the, the black generation's understanding of what happened in the past. So right now, pro-Palestinian people are saying Ferguson is an example of what is happening in Palestine and y'all are getting what we're getting. That's just bullshit. First, there's no time period in which black people and slave domination have ever ended. Second, the Arabs and, Jew and the Jews are as much a part of the black slave trade, the creation of blackness as social death as anyone else. As I told a friend of mine, yeah, we're going to help you get rid of Israel, but the moment you set up your shit, we're going to be right there to jack you up because anti-blackness is as important and necessary to the formation of Arab psychic life as it is to the formation of Jewish psychic life. I believe that looking at it from an anti-capitalist perspective, from an anti-white supremacist perspective, the Palestinians are right, provisionally, until they get their shit, then they're wrong. So this is a historical thing. What we have to do is remind each other to know our history in terms of slavery and our resistance to it, but also to be able to have x-ray vision and say that just because we're walking around in suits and ties and are professors and journalists doesn't mean we're not slaves. That is, to understand things diachronically, and that will allow us to be in coalition with people of color, moving on the system with them, but ridiculing them at the same time for paucity, the lameness of their desire and demand. And for the fact that we know once they get over their own hurdles, the anti-blackness that sustains them will rear its ugly head again against us so that we don't fall into a sort of genuine bonding with people who are really primarily using black energy to catalyze the, and energize their struggle. In Ferguson, we can see the problem. So many people in the streets declaring, I am human too. And there it is, the symptoms of black recognition that we are up against something much larger than just police brutality, much larger than poverty and discrimination, that we are still unconscious. As we're marching in the streets and angry at, and, and a reporter comes and sticks microphone, a microphone in our face and will yell, I am human too, if that's the first words out of so many people's mouths, then the unconscious is trying to tell you something about the real nature of your oppression that even you can't handle. And I, can, and I say you, meaning me too, because I don't, think, I don't like to think about this all the time and I write about it. But what Ferguson is doing is providing a space in which black youth, youth primarily, because I'm sorry to say that I'm almost 59 years old and most of the people my age are not contributing to this dialogue in the way that I would like them to, can use their skepticism and their anger to say, wait a minute, I'm not going for the okie doke from Al Sharpton who says, don't riot because this is not about you. What do you mean this is not about me? And what do you mean don't riot? Are you about dealing are you about dealing with this situation or are you giving this speech as another form of black anger management? End quote. So I understand taken out of context, taken in that one graph, it comes across as maybe terse, caustic, but I don't think that the underlying point he's making is given fair run when it's just dismissed as, oh, he's saying we can't be in solidarity with Palestinians and that and any notion of that is bullshit. Why is he saying it's bullshit? Not because he's saying we shouldn't be in solid, as I interpret it, not because he's saying we shouldn't be in solidarity with Palestinians, but he's saying that that doesn't get to the true nature of what our problem is or what, or what the black condition is in relationship to these state white formations. And I think it's unfair to, 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 and I do admit a bias that, that, that not only in terms of the way Frank, I was introduced to his story in Incognito, but the, I do admit a bias 
when it feels to me that like anyone, including other black people, are telling black people, you don't have a right to analyze any situation in any way, that you don't have a right or have no room or should be dismissed because you've raised a question that I at least has a, 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 a sound basis in historical fact and logic. So I've always rebe I've, I've always struggled with even where I don't fully agree. We've talked about it with Frank where I don't always agree or I don't always understand. But my point is always kind of the same with all of us. I feel like there's not enough room for principled and even just comradely disagreement. And I don't understand why. I think well, I could speculate, but but I don't like that so much is is there's is so quick to just want to dismiss even a conversation or an investigation of what is actually being said. And it's it's not even necessary in a piece like the Spectre piece to even make reference to this. What is the point other than to hold Frank up as a straw man so that you can make the point that black people should be in solidarity? What about all of, are there, is there no one else who you think is, is discouraging that? Why is Frank dragged into that? And then I do feel a kind of way that, that it also involves an interview that I was a part of. And, and, and so kind of like with the trained Marxist things, my name keeps coming up in some of these little Google alerts and little footnotes here and there. And, and I'm like, man, and cause I get my Google scholar alerts and stuff like, and, and this article gets, this gets, it gets referenced a lot actually. And I think almost, and I rarely, if ever, see it fairly referenced. And it's and none of his other discussion is referenced. It's, it's like so, or the rest of that interview even. So I did want to, you know, because this, of course, when Frank was last on the on the show, this came up. I started the show with this, so I just want to recap and let him speak for himself on this issue, and then we can we can move on. Uh, uh, in a recent interview I did with Nora Erekat, uh, the Palestinian lawyer and activist, she she uh, had put me in, you know, she put me up on an interview that she had done with Mark Lamont Hill, where where our interview for some years ago, one of them, a transcript of them, was used uh, as a way to discredit Afro pessimism as, a, as and to say that Afro pessimism encourages a lack of solidarity. And in that excerpted piece, you were saying, uh, 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 um, uh, and the, I don't know, the transcript rang true to my memory, at least. You're, you, you know, what you, what you were basically saying is that listen, Palestinians uh, will work with them and we'll struggle with them. But at, at, after we get them over at free from Israel, we're going to have to check them on their anti blackness. And I said, I agreed. But this was extrapolated to mean that there can be no solidarity. And I've heard this many times. People have said this to me a lot. And I've always said, but I don't get that from your work. Now, it is true I don't understand everything, including your latest book. I'm not going to claim to understand it all. We'll get to that in a minute. But but uh, so I wanted to really just start right there. Can you just clarify before we get into the, the, the depth as much as possible of your, your of the theory? Are you dis, are, is your argument intending to discourage black people from struggling uh, at all, uh, from appreciating their their uh, radical um, political uh, histories? Uh, and are you saying that there should be no solidarity with other folks? Because to the point about Lewis Gordon, since then I have read a good number of the critics critics. And on these issues, I don't understand or agree with their what they're saying in terms of how they interpret your work. but but anyway, so let's just start there. Are you saying any of that in your work, intending to at least? Absolutely not. However, I do understand how it could be perceived as my having said that, because most people come at a unequivocally black cry and, a, and an unapologetically black analysis of everyone else. In other words, people come, people in people experience us looking at them analytically as an assault on them. And 
And so what happens is that Afro-pessimism is an analytic interpretation of everyone else's capacity. I'll repeat that, an analytic interpretation of everyone else's capacity. And just as Marx condemns the capacity of the capitalists, whether it's a good capitalist like George Soros, who uh, is actually, uh, I want to give a shout out to George Soros because um, he's, he's a part of the, the, the distribution network for Afro-pessimism when he poured millions of dollars into uh, urban, uh, urban debate camps. What he did is he, is he created, a, he created a, a, a pipeline for Afro-pessimist texts to be um, infused in the inner city without even knowing what he did. So, so thank you, my man, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, but, but what I'm trying to say is that what I don't give a fuck about, can I swear on here? Absolutely. Okay. I really don't <laughs> care that the sentimental response to the analytic critique clouds the other person's capacity to understand the analysis. I, I think that we, have, for, for, for hundreds of years, we have reached across the water and tried to help these people understand our suffering and understand their relationship to it. And that's a, that's a, uh, that's a kind of cosmic um, manifestation that, that began you know, over 1400 years ago in the Bantu migration, it's called Ubuntu which means goodwill and compassion and, and love of the other. And so what you can say, what you can rightfully say is that there is no Ubuntu in Afro-pessimism. It's just a cold gaze. But that doesn't mean that it's actually saying what the other people experience it to be saying. Uh, solidarity is, is, I mean, I've, I've, you know, I'm checking myself now at 65 on, on my solidarity, I'm, I'm, I'm fucking sick of it. Uh, I have struggled in more people's uh, oppression contexts who are not black over the past 53 years than I have in decidedly black struggles. And so attitudinally, I don't have any more um, energy or um, compassion uh for someone who can't see that um what you just said at the very beginning that israel is a blight on if not the world the middle east you know the united states is a blight on the world and, and israel is is a extension of that blight and um so much in the middle east would be restabilized restabilized if Israel did not exist. But that restabilization would not do anything essential for the liberation of Black people. And I did a six-hour uh, um, Afro-pessimist workshop for 35 activists slash leaders of Black Lives Matter from Pennsylvania, New York City, and uh, in New Jersey back in 2016. This was at the, actually the Audubon Ballroom, which is now the Malcolm X uh, Shabazz Foundation. And in that, in that um, six hour workshop, the Black Lives Matter people talked to me about a sojourn they took to Palestine for two weeks in which uh, they were going with this whole idea that Ferguson is Palestine. And before they went, they had asked the Palestinians in Gaza if they could meet, and Ramallah, if they could meet uh, Black Palestinians. And they were told, yes. And when they got there, they were redirected for, for, for almost 10 days away from meeting any Black Palestinians. And when they finally put their foot down and insisted that they do that, they had one-on-ones with Black Palestinians who talked about the structure of feeling of anti-blackness that they experience in a community that's being bombed every day by the Israelis, okay? They didn't talk about Israeli anti-blackness. They talked about Palestinian anti-blackness. I had the same experience when I spent six weeks in Cuba, you know, and, and this is, and I'm really sick and tired of people, you know, and, and, what, and what I mean by that is, is I was uh, with, with uh, Medea Benjamin's group, um, Global Exchange uh, in Cuba for six weeks. And um, we were 13 Americans, three of us black, um, and we were paired with two young communists 
And we went all around the island together for, for that period. And we met with government officials and went to hospitals. It was a groovy experience. And then at one point, the Black Cubans said, we would like a session with the Black Americans, just the, black, just the three Black Americans. And so three Black Americans met with about eight Black Cubans out of that 26 group of Black Cubans. And the white people from the United States, the 10 white people were like, okay, cool. We'll go on a bus, a field trip for a day. So y'all can have the crib. We lived in this big house in Verdada, which was a rich neighborhood that had been subdivided for poor people. But the white Cubans were like, what the hell is going on? Uh, we're all communists here. We're all, you know, and so, and then, and to, and to make matters even worse, so this is what I, this is why psychoanalysis is so important to, to, to Afro-pessimism, because the force of the unconscious is what you described to me in your opening remarks. And the force of the unconscious actually doesn't have any relational dynamic to it. The force of the unconscious is such that these three Black Americans, one of them was fluent in Spanish. Another one was taking intermediate Spanish. I was taking beginning Spanish, okay? But because I was the oldest, I guess, I don't know, or maybe the darkest, I don't know. But the white Cubans vamped on me and demanded that I come to some kind of luncheon tribunal with them where they accused me of fomenting racial divisions on the island. This is, this is a global phenomenon where, where these people feel victimized by our um, critique of their capacities to be and often of how they use their capacities. And I'm very sorry. Afro-pessimism is about them. It is not to them. There's been too many hundreds of years of Ubuntu where we have said, okay, how are you feeling about this? How are you experiencing this? Okay, I don't give a rat's ass anymore. So on that regard, they're right. But, I, but in terms of the analytic, they're absolutely wrong because I've done nothing but solidarity work throughout my whole goddamn life. So again, I'll, I'll make the link available if it's not already there. You can you can watch that whole interview, uh, but you know, and I see you. I see you too, Hiram. I see like a lot of good people. I'm 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 here for it, but I guess all I can say is is when folks drag his name, I don't think that they, you know, and it's fact, in fact, in fact, Hiram, a lot of people who who got that problem with him. You just don't read, beloved. <laughs> But listen, my point is, whatever, what could I say? Uh, 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 we're not always going to agree and be on the exact same page, you know. But I just think it's unfair to drag him in the way that that article did, in the way he keeps getting dragged, when I don't think people are hearing what he's saying. So, okay. Okay. <laughs>